My name is Savannah Sly. I'm a sex worker and an advocate for the rights, safety, and dignity of people in the sex trade. And today's presentation is called Canaries in the Tech Coal Mine, Lessons on Technological Oppression from the Sex Worker Rights Movement. Next slide, please. So before we get started, I want to ask everybody in the audience if you routinely protect your own privacy in any of the following ways. Um, some of these ways include using a VPN or blurring your face in photographs. Maybe you use encryption or burner apps. You disable location tracking. Maybe you turn off all your devices when you go through travel checkpoints, both domestic and international. Uh, maybe you strip your photos of metadata, password protect your devices. Maybe you even carry a magnet to wipe your devices in case you have to. Um, if you answered yes to many of these, next slide, please. You might be a sex worker. Sex workers practice a lot of these things on a daily basis because we have to. We have to protect our privacy for our personal safety because of the stigma and discrimination we face from society, but also because a great deal of our work is criminalized and censored. And so we try and avoid detection from law enforcement and the state. But sex workers aren't the only people who practice these privacy measures, as I'm sure you're all aware. Uh, privacy is really important and being able to access these privacy tools um, means that people can uh, look for information that might be considered forbidden in a given society. It might help people who are victims of um, uh, stalking or violence um, protect themselves and go undetected from their perpetrators. People who are part of oppressed minorities might practice these um, privacy measures. It's all, these are all tools that everybody uses and increasingly so in our digitized world. And that's why we need to pay attention to what's happening to sex workers as far as our access to these tools goes. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, real quick definition, um, when we're talking about sex work, uh, I tend to use a very broad definition. So it's the exchange of sexual or erotic services, performances or products for material compensation that could be money or other goods. And here we've listed a whole slew of activities that count as sex work under that definition. Um, it's a pretty broad umbrella. And today we're gonna mostly focus on what the internet and online tools have done for sex workers of all stripes. Uh, next slide, please. So as Mia said, sex workers have always been on the cutting edge of technology um, out of necessity um, because we keep having, we keep being displaced, um, but also because we're entrepreneurial and we use these good tools to um, increase our profit and our business and also to keep ourselves safer in our business. Um, so I've highlighted um, two really important things that the internet has done for sex workers, but there's a number of things that we have gained along with the rest of society that are benefits to our welfare and safety. So um, the advent of online advertising, I really want to focus on that. When we're talking about online advertising, we're talking about essentially digital classifieds. Um, people have heard of websites like Backpage or back in the day it was Craigslist Erotic Services. There's uh, dozens or hundreds of these websites and they're actually really important for sex worker safety because number one, it gives sex workers independence from third party management. Sex workers used, used to be far more dependent on an agency or a manager or um, going to a house where they would work, uh, and it, you know, a, a a brothel or a strip club, um, because those were the ways to get clients. Um, with the advent of the internet, sex workers are able to take their own pictures, write their own copy and post their own ads, completely cutting out third party management. And that is great for our independence. It also, uh, the second important point is that it gives us time to evaluate whether a prospective client is safe. And we can use online tools to essentially run our own background checks. Um, so outside of uh, online, advertising, access to payment processors and cryptocurrency has been really great for us. It makes us less cash dependent. And sex workers tend to be targets for robbery because we operate in a primarily cash-based economy. Um, the internet gives us multiple streams of income. We don't have to just work in person anymore. We can do webcamming or we can um, create our own erotic media and sell it online. Um, you may have heard of OnlyFans has been in the news a lot lately. OnlyFans is one of many platforms where sex workers are um, making a living. And um, this, is a total, this is like a separate presentation, but I'd like for you all to consider what the pandemic has done as far as expanding um, the amount of people who are engaged in this kind of online erotic trade. 
um, being stuck at home, still needing to make money. I think um, we probably have more new sex workers online than ever because of the pandemic, but that's a separate presentation. Um, and then lastly, social media and having our own websites. It's free marketability. And most importantly, it allows us to see and connect with and talk with our own peers and share safety information because sex work can be really isolating because of the stigma. Next slide, please. So um, we have all these great advancements to sex worker welfare, but tech, uh, technological oppression against sex workers is increasing. Why is this? We're gonna go over the ways in which we're experiencing this and why the general public should be concerned. Next slide, please. We're gonna use an analogy to understand what's happening to sex workers. Um, society is increasingly concerned about exploitation and the sex trade. You've probably heard of sex trafficking. Sex workers are also concerned about this because we are in the waters where this exists and we encounter it ourselves. We encounter exploitation and sex workers have really good ideas about how to decrease exploitation, but society doesn't really wanna listen to us um, because we're not seen as credible. Um, so we're gonna think of um, the water as the sex trade economy. Society is concerned about sharks like Jeffrey Epstein, exploiters, traffickers, bad guys, big sharks. And society is casting a wide net to try and catch these sharks. And the net in this case is policies like increased criminalization and also the increased use of tools that are um, surveillance, uh, algorithmically based, anything they can use to try and identify uh, what they consider to be sex trafficking. But what's happening is we're catching sex workers in the nets. Big sharks like Jeffrey Epstein chew right through those nets. But sex workers, everyday people who are just trying to make a living are getting completely ensnared in these tools that are meant to end exploitation. And it's actually causing great danger. Next slide, please. So one of the biggest nets that was cast recently in the United States was the passage of two congressional bills. Um, they're called SESTA and FOSTA. They stand for the Stop Enabling Sex Trafficking Act and the Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act, respectively. Uh, Trump signed these into law in 2018 um, and protests erupted around the country from sex workers, such as this protester here, um, because what this law did is it amended Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act to make internet website providers legally liable for any content posted by third parties on their website that could have anything to do with sex trafficking. So in a nutshell, it means um, the, the definition of sex trafficking here is so broad that it could be any commercial sexual exchange that could be construed as sex trafficking. So all website providers, if a person like me puts up an ad, all of a sudden they are feloniously liable for what I could be doing on their website. So what this did is um, it essentially um, makes uh, internet, or, you know, website providers police free speech amongst um, adults who are trying to engage in sex work together. Um, and we saw immediately within two weeks the shuttering of dozens and dozens of online advertising sites that just didn't want to take that legal risk. And as we saw earlier, um, having these online advertising sites has been really important for sex worker safety and also in becoming independent and not depending on third parties to work for. Um, so SESTA and FOSTA has been one of the biggest nets cast that has has um, been a huge rollback to our welfare. And the general public should be concerned because this is sort of a way that the government can use private companies to, to police free speech and censor the internet. Next slide, please. So, um, so online censorship is one way that sex workers are being technologically oppressed, but we also have algorithmic discrimination. Um, the use of algorithms to kind of weed out and find undesirable web presences, sex workers. Um, uh, we see this a lot in banking and payment processors. Increasingly, in the name of ending sex trafficking, we are seeing um, sex workers who deposit cash into their bank accounts, having those bank accounts frozen and shut down without warning or explanation. After a great deal of digging, we find that um, it triggered a fraud alert or a high-risk activity alert and um, it, because of the concerns around sex trafficking, these fraud detection algorithms have been increasingly used and it tends to affect um, single women who are depositing cash into their bank accounts. And we saw this uh, increase during the pandemic. Um, we're also seeing algorithms used to censor people. Um, shadow banning is a practice by which, I'm so sorry for the noise in the background. <laughs> um, um, Shadow banning uh, on social media is a, a means of using algorithms to find any kind of profile that might be undesirable um, socially and to essentially make it null and void. 
it's like shouting into the darkness and nobody can hear you. So you can, your internet handle cannot be searched. It cannot be found. You are shadow banned. And we're seeing that increasingly against sex workers. Also straight up service denial. Services like Airbnb are using um, AI tools to scan the web for all data points on a given customer who might be looking to use Airbnb and connecting those data points to determine whether they might be um, a sex worker, regardless of whether they're intending on doing sex work at Air Airbnb or not. So people are being denied access to Airbnb and also dating websites because somewhere on the internet um, on totally different profiles, they may have a sex work background. And um, that's a form of discrimination that we're really concerned about. Next slide, please. Data exploitation. Uh, this is one of the scarier ones. So we're all really concerned about um, face surveillance and um, uh, facial recognition technology. Um, sex workers are having their faces data mined by organizations and private entities that are looking to end sex trafficking. And this is very concerning because um, so groups like Thorn, Thorn is committed to ending sex trafficking, but they are data mining, escorting websites, those online websites I talked about, and they're taking um, all those faces and all that data and handing it to law enforcement and law enforcement is combing through it and doing whatever they want with it. Sex workers don't see law enforcement as allies or a safe resource for a multitude of reasons. And so to have um, all these profiles just handed over to law enforcement for some private company's profit is deeply disturbing. And that's one example of data exploitation of sex workers. Um, lastly, stolen media and services like artists and other creators, um, sex workers have their media um, pirated and uploaded, um, it's unauthorized, and um, groups like Pornhub, websites, have been pretty deaf to sex worker concerns. It's usually no changes occur until a moral entity comes along and complains about the presence of porn online, then changes are made, but those changes don't usually benefit sex workers and um, can in fact increase our exposure to harm. Next slide, please. So um, the impacts of all of this are pretty clear. Um, we see um, an increase in danger and a decrease in safety, a decrease in income, access to our community and safety information, a decrease in our ability to access and screen clients, um, and also a, 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 an inability to access victims of exploitation. Law enforcement uses online advertising sites to identify missing people. And when those websites get taken down, private detectives and law enforcement cannot identify trafficking victims. So it's all, it's a really backwards way that we're going about this with online censorship. Uh, we see increased stra uh, class stratification, sex workers who have access to resources um, and technology and the time to navigate these tricky waters um, fare better than their counterparts who don't, um, which is unjust. Um, extreme stresses on mental health, um, our chances of being doxxed or outed or having to depend on third parties goes up. It's a mess. <laughs> Next slide, please. So um, the sex worker rights movement is global. And here are some beautiful pictures from around the world of sex workers protesting for their basic rights. And discrimination against sex workers is the marker of an unjust society. That's why we are canaries in the coal mine. What happens to sex workers will eventually happen to the general public. And these rollbacks to our um, ability to speak online and our privacy. Um, we're speaking up today because you should all be concerned about this. It is coming for you and it's affecting us on a daily basis. Um, and also sex workers are all around you that we occupy every sector of society. You just might not know it. So the takeaway from everything today is just listen to sex workers because we have important information to share and we wanna be in coalition with you as we address these uh, problems. Uh, last slide, please. So um, sex workers are speaking up. There's, um, if you want to learn more about this on my Twitter handle, you can go to my link tree and I've posted um, some resources at the top if you want to read articles about this or visit any of these groups that are doing really good work to address um, technological discrimination. Hacking and Hustling has some great research on shadow banning, which is the social media censorship I talked about. Assembly 4 is in Australia and they are creating uh, accessible platforms for sex workers to advertise and communicate on. And then Accept It's Matters is an organizing effort to address banking discrimination against sex workers. So thank you all so much for having me here. If there's time, I'll take a question. And also thank you for rolling with me during my technical um, issues. Let's see. Let's yeah, we do have a few minutes for Q and A. Our next session, just to remind everybody, is at um, in, at yeah at, at fifty five. 
just looking at the time zone different, I'm trying to convert in my head. So 10.55, we will have a few of my, my joiners, but so we have a few minutes. But Savannah, thank you so much, first of all, for sharing this. This was so enlightening. And I feel like this is so true to our principle of including communities that we don't hear from. Because like you said, we there's so much information that you've already shared with us. And there's so much more we could be learning if tech companies would only open up and listen. So that said, let's just look at some Q&A here. Um, let's see. Okay. Identified as an anonymous attendee. Uh, would you like to pick the ones you want to answer, respond to? Um, I'm having a hard time seeing them. I'm on my phone. Okay. Let me scroll through. I can, I can read out. Would you, would you okay. like me to just read out? Okay. Oh, that'd be wonderful. Thank you, Mia. Absolutely. Uh, so how can we leverage sex workers' insights and perspective to protect children from sexual predators? There's a similar one about trafficking uh, mm -hmm. as well. Absolutely. So um, sex workers are, as I said, we're in the waters with exploitation. Uh, our, our whole economy, you can think of it as any other economy. You can think of it as agriculture or domestic labor in hotels or restaurant work. Exploitation exists in all of these spaces, um, but all of those sectors, at least in the United States, there's basic labor rights. And we firmly believe, I mean, a lot of us have experienced exploitation because we're in these waters without access to calling. We can't even call 911 if something happens to us because we might get arrested. So um, first things first, recognizing that sex work is a form of labor and that sex workers need access to very basic labor rights. We also need to stop arresting sex workers and people in the sex trade. And that also goes for minors. There are minors who trade sex uh, by choice or circumstance or coercion. And in many, many states in the United States, um, minors engaged in prostitution can still be arrested. And so if I think I can, if somebody assaults me, um, but I think calling the police will mean I get arrested, that's a double trauma that I'm not going to risk. So we need to stop the arrests. Um, we need to work with people in the sex trade to understand how the economy works. Um, the shutting down of those online websites, like I said, that was a real um, disservice to ending exploitation in the sex trade because if there's a missing person, private detectives and law enforcement could literally go on those websites, find a person who looks like that, call the number and arrange an appointment to see them. And that was a number one tool for recovering people, especially runaways who might find themselves in that situation. So um, we tend to have a knee jerk reaction to um, our, our, our gut feelings about the sex trade. And that's understandable. It's not for everybody and it's shrouded in mystery and it's a complicated place. Um, but we really need to take a hard look at it and be in dialogue with the people who are in these spaces all the time and who really understand it. Completely agree with everything you just said. Um, we need to be doing more to protect are uh, most vulnerable, especially minors. So uh, one question are from Katrina. Thank you, Lisa, for po posting that. On the banking issue, um, are you finding crypto being an acceptable like um, alternative to the traditional payment methods? How do you feel about that? That's a great question. So sex workers have been um, some of the first movers on cryptocurrency by necessity. Uh, because we are getting our banking tools cut off from us, uh, PayPal, Cash App, Venmo, traditional banking, all of that is increasingly hard to use. Um, so we've been pivoting to cryptocurrency. Uh, it's acceptable. Some people use it. Our, our clientele are not quite there yet. Um, sex workers are much more impacted by these laws than our clientele generally. Um, that's not to say that they're not impacted, but they don't um, have the level of paranoia <laughs> that we do usually. Um, and so it, it's, it's hard to get paid in cryptocurrency consistently, but um, the sex trade economy has been sort of an innovator in the um, digital token space through webcamming. So a lot of sex workers who are webcammers or um, who trade digital content online that's erotic are accustomed to getting paid in tokens that you later cash in for your currency of choice. So that it's like, it's not Bitcoin, but it is a form of digital currency that has been used for a long time in the sex trade economy. Um, so I hope that answers your question. It's, it's a mixed bag. It depends on what kind of sex work you're doing. If you're doing online sex work, people are more accustomed to that digital currency. But if you're doing in-person sex work and want to get paid in digital currency, there are some hurdles and it's a learning curve for a lot of people. Thank you for that. There was a question similar to it, uh, but not as specific. Any other technology uh, innovations that you feel could actually support sex workers' businesses? 
You know, it's pretty simple. I think just granting sex workers access to all the tools that are benefiting all of society, you know, the ability to do use payment processors online or to have a website, you know, it's like we're all hosting our websites overseas now because they get shut down. And like, it's it really it, it impedes your business. It makes it very hard to do business and people do sex work to make money. But then also the um, the, the danger and mental health and stress ramifications can't be understated. And um, I know that I am I'm a very privileged sex worker and I acknowledge that and come to you today with that full understanding. And I've talked to and met with possibly thousands of sex workers in my life and career. And um, not everybody has the bandwidth, the access, the tools, the time to learn how to navigate all this. So I think just like taking the boot off the neck of sex workers and letting them do their business and access the same tools that everybody else is would really be a great start. We don't need new technology.